Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Aiko Doden, Senior Commentator at NHK, Japan Broadcasting Corporation, and I will be the moderator for this session. Now, our session's topic is Taking Myanmar to Work. The session will be recorded and broadcast worldwide on NHK World TV on Saturday, June the 15th. It can also be watched online at the time of the broadcast. The video of this session will also be available on the World Economic Forum website after NHK World broadcast. As I said, the session will be recorded, so please do take your seat and turn off your mobile phones and no flashlights during the recording. We will start the recording shortly. In 2011, Tianjin became president of Myanmar. Yes, our president! Soon after, the country began its move towards democratization. Myanmar is now changing rapidly. Western sanctions have largely been lifted, and economic reforms have been undertaken. At last year's World Economic Forum on East Asia, Aung San Suu Kyi made an appeal. Job creation is extremely important in Burma, and together with George, job creation must go training, the kind of training that will enable our unemployed young to take up jobs. Myanmar has a population of 60 million. Although literacy is high, the country's GDP per capita is one of the lowest in Southeast Asia, and narrowing the poverty gap is a critical issue. The world has high hopes for reliable labor coming from Myanmar, but the country needs to nurture people with skills adapted to modern industry. We discuss what kind of human resource development is needed in Myanmar to create sustainable growth there. Hello everyone, welcome to Asian Voices. I'm Aiko Doden. Thank you for joining this NHK World TV discussion, Taking Myanmar to Work. It has been two years since the recent move towards democracy began in 2011. To ensure further reform and solidify change, Myanmar needs the right people to continue the right development. Today, we are going to hold a discussion about the issues Myanmar faces and how companies entering the market here, as well as the international community, might help to find keys to solving these issues. Well, let me introduce our panelists to you. From Myanmar, we have Do Aung San Suu Kyi. Perhaps she needs no introduction, but she is a longtime leader of democracy movements in Myanmar and the chairperson of the National League for Democracy, or NLD. She is also a member of Myanmar's parliament. And from India, we have Subramanian Ramadurai. He's an advisor to the Prime Minister in, in India's National Skill Development Council, providing guidance on career education at the national level. Mr. Ramadurai is also the Vice Chairman of Tata Consultancy Services, which provides IT services and consulting worldwide. And from the Philippines, we have Jaime Augusto Zobelde Ayala, Chairman and CEO of the Ayala Corporation. Ayala Corporation is one of the largest business groups in the Philippines, founded in 1834. Ayala has investments in the real estate, banking, telecom, water, automotive, electronics, and outsourcing industries. From Japan, we have Hiroto Arakawa, Vice President of the Japan International Cooperation Agency, or JICA. JICA has been actively supporting Myanmar for many years as Japan's aid organization, in areas as public health, education, and human resource development. And from Singapore, we have Annie Ko, Vice President of the Office of Business Development and External Relations at Singapore Management University. Her office explores ways to link different kinds of institutions, such as universities, corporations, and government offices. Well, thank you all for joining the discussion today. Well, this session is titled Taking Myanmar to Work. It is about creating jobs, about making people employable, 
making the right match between talents and jobs to bring about sustainable and inclusive growth in Myanmar? And the question is how? Well, before we address these questions, um, Doan San Suu Kyi, let me uh, begin by asking you uh, a couple of uh, questions. So, um, you have recently said in Yangon that um, the last three years saw so no, no tangible changes, especially in the area of rule of law and the peace process. Um, are you somewhat taken aback by the ministers or business delegations parading into Myanmar uh, one after the other? Now, they seem to have decided that the change is happening and that the time to do business has finally arrived. Um, you have said before that the caution is all in order when it comes to doing business in Myanmar. Are you still of the same view when you say at the same time change is needed? I think it's the businesses which are of that view now because, as I said earlier, there are more investigations than solid investment. I think you will find that investments certainly don't, don't follow the visits of businessmen. So the reason why I think there is hesitancy is because, exactly because of what I talked about before, rule of law. Their concerns are now, I find, basically rule of law and infrastructure. These are the two constraints against actual investment. Yes, they look, come here to see if uh, it is, the time is right for in investment, and they certainly see uh, this country as a tremendous possibility, as having tremendous potential. But the investments are certainly not rolling in. For these reasons, they are not certain about the position of rule of law and the lack of infrastructure is too overwhelming. Mm -hmm. and, and you have often um, spoken about the Myanmar's need for um, its people to be trained and the need for more jobs to be created and that uh, you know, everything uh, has to happen very quickly. You know, results have to be uh, produced as quickly as possible. Um, in what way uh, creating jobs and the capacity building of the Myanmar people themselves um, crucial in the context of Myanmar's democratization? First of all, of course, we've got to remember that our country has suffered from a very bad education system for many decades, so that our young people, and not so young people, because uh, there are many in their 40s who are really not, uh, not equipped uh, to get gainful employment. That is because of a poor education system. So what we need is both education and jobs. So what it amounts to is that we have to concentrate on uh, vocational training and on the job training. Mm -hmm. Because people in their 40s, it's not easy for them to go back to school of any kind, whether it's vocational school or non-formal education. So they need to be trained on the job because they need jobs. So we want to encourage the kind of investment which will bring both work and skills to our country. So that is to say, on the job training. And of course, we want as much support as possible for vocational training programs. Well, I think uh, Do Wang San Suu Kyi has articulated for us uh, some of the main challenges that Myanmar faces. So now on to how can business contribute to uh, human capital development in Myanmar? Um, a rosy picture shows, according to an ADB estimate, Myanmar's GDP growth rising to 6.7% in the fiscal year 2014. Another more recent analysis predicts that uh, Myanmar's economy can quadruple to over $200 billion by the year 2030. Myanmar is rich in natural resources and is blessed with abundant working age population aged between 15 and 64 of about um, 46 billion. But Myanmar is also a country with per capita GDP of a approximately about uh, $800, only one seventieth of that of Singapore. So Mr. Ramadurai, you know, Tata Consultancy Services is expanding IT services globally. Uh, you have visited Myanmar five times, I right. understand, already. Um, how do you position Myanmar in your global strategy? How would you create jobs and make people employable? I think uh, it's a great question, and now uh, Aung San Suu Kyi very correctly said that any skill or any training you provide must result in jobs. Skilling for the sake of skilling is just not acceptable because a skilled worker with no job is a bigger problem than unskilled and unemployed. I think the vocational education is another one which is absolutely critical. Mm -hmm. And when we look at the Tata group, we look at it in terms of building ground up, 
starting from the scratch, where recruitment from the colleges or recruitment from any polytechnics and then training them, where the program of apprenticeship is extremely important. On the job training, followed by the theoretical foundations, are exceptionally, ex extremely necessary, and we need to be completely committed to it. More importantly, what we want to do it in, in Myanmar is to set up, with the Government of India's help, a Myanmar Institute of Information Technology in Mandalay. We are already implementing it in terms of starting the first batch of students with classes in September of this year. Students would go to Bangalore and then come here. In addition, we are going to be training the trainers and then training the students for the undergraduate program of four years. Over a period of four to five years, we want to scale up to about 1,000 students okay. per year. And this will be one of the world-class institutions which can be used as a benchmark. I think uh, the schooling system has to address the vocational education because unless you start the kids early with hands-on experience, the dexterity, the ability to learn a new trade, you cannot, at the age of 40 or 40 plus, bring them into the vocational stream. Mm -hmm. Third, from a policy perspective, what we are trying to do in India, which is possible on a global basis, also it's happening, is a national skills framework, which essentially means this is the kind of framework for a particular trade, and then the competency levels, which gives you the diploma, the certification to get a job. The private sector must be a part of this journey and must provide the jobs and the apprenticeship programs. That's the way I would put it, and that's what we are committed to. Well, um, in other words, uh, Myanmar is in need of uh, human resources to cope with the change that is happening at every level. It's Absolutely. The... It's not just in one level, but across the system. I see. Well, let me go on to Mr. Ayala. Um, you know, uh, given your experience in the Philippines, um, how do you think the, the business uh, can contribute to development human capital uh, in Myanmar? Uh, what skills are needed in your view? Thank you. Um, in the Philippines, we have a population of getting close to 100 million people, um, the vast majority of which are really can be considered under the youth sector. Our, our problems are, are, are very similar to the ones that Madame Aung San Suu Kyi uh, has made reference to and our, our, our friend from India. Um, I think increasingly um, the way we view it in our country is that if we don't address the needs of this growing population, we have one of the highest growth rates, uh, population growth rates in, in Asia, um, we will not be faced with the potential demographic dividend that we should be looking for. Um, so the key is how to get the youth employed. Mm. Um, and I echo uh, the words of Madame Aung San Suu Kyi and, 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 and our friends from the Tata group that uh, there has to be a new engagement uh, about looking for employability and, and the focus of education. Um, this is an issue in the Philippines because uh, generally most parents uh, who pay for the education of these young people end up focusing on college degrees. They want a college degree for their, for their child. And increasingly, the whole vocational system, which has been referred to, uh, Germany has been very successful in this, in this sector and managed to bring their unemployment down to the lowest in Europe by using a very strong uh, internship program, vocational program, in getting uh, youths, uh, particularly even straight out of high school, straight into, into a position of employability. The, the, the point I just want to make is that I think there is a role for business to play. Mm -hmm. I think increasingly in our country we're testing models where business, academe, and government are working together to address a tremendous backlog uh, in the educational sector. Uh, business is providing um, some knowledge on the skill sets needed. Um, academe is, is adjusting their, their, their programs to fit that, and the government is creating a framework of support for this new structure. Um, just maybe to highlight one example, uh, in the year 2000, uh, we had no business processing outsourcing industry in the Philippines at all. Uh, fast forward to today, uh, maybe just 13 years later, it's a $15 billion industry, and we have 1 million people employed in this sector. This took a tremendous amount of work on the private sector side to get engaged. Uh, they formed an association. We actually followed the model of India. That industry association then leveraged its clout uh, with the academic institutions, uh, adjusted the um, uh, academic uh, skills of the students coming out and prepared them uh, to enter this uh, business processing uh, outsourcing industry and prepare the students with computer skills and English necessary right. to be relevant. It resulted in a great industry. It resulted in more employment and that can be done across many industries. I see. Well, I think the, the two business leaders uh, have managed to convince us that the, the private sectors, the companies, can 
uh, participate uh, in, in bringing about the change that is happening in this country. I wonder, Do Wan San Suji, how would you respond to these uh, gentlemen's uh, comments? Oh, very positively, and I'm very glad that you mentioned uh, a vocational training in Germany. My model actually is Switzerland, <laughs> but uh, of course the Germans will claim that their model is better. Now, the reason why I say Switzerland is because uh, you, you, you mentioned a very important factor that in our part of the world, parents still want their children to go in for academic education. They want a degree. They want something they can hang up on the wall, you know, cap and gown and everything. Now, I you must think have many of those. Well, I, well, I have very few of those, actually, <laughs> in the form of photographs. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, this, this is, I think, the weakness of our Eastern nations. Mm. We do put a lot of emphasis on academic attainment, achievement. But in Switzerland, what I liked so much was the fact that there was no discrimination against vocational trained uh, students. And they themselves don't feel themselves to be second class citizens because I spoke to some of them when I was in Switzerland and I asked them, do you feel that you're treated at second, as second class mm -hmm. because you're in the vocational training scheme and not in a university, and they said, no, uh, we, we don't feel this. We are treated with respect, the same as everybody else, and they were full of self-confidence. And you know the reason for this is very simple. Their earning capacity is as great, as, if not greater, than the ones who go to university. Mm -hmm. And in the end, it's earning capacity. Right. Because your education, your skills, should enable you to stand on your own two feet, mm -hmm. uh, to decrease your dependency. And everywhere I go in Burma, this is what I see, that what people want is uh, to be free of a sense of dependency. True independence is that, is that you don't have to depend on others in order to carve out your own destiny. And I really think that PPP is essential, private-public partnership mm -hmm. is essential, because in Switzerland, um, I think as in probably in Germany, although I'm more familiar with the Swiss model, the vocational training students spend three, three days a week right. at the schools, two days at businesses, mm -hmm. at the industries mm -hmm. which they eventually hope to join. So that by the time they have finished their training, there are jobs waiting for them and they're ready to take over those jobs. And the same can't be said of the university graduates. Mm -hmm. So that's what gives uh, vocational training an edge. Mm -hmm. No, um, Mr. Alakawa, there, there are two questions that I want to, to ask you. Um, you know, we are talking about the job creation and human capacity building um, following what the, our, our three panelists have articulated for us. JICA has been engaged in providing humanitarian assistance to Myanmar. Um, I understand the country is faced with diverse uh, challenges, including lack of infrastructure and the legal mechanism to accommodate uh, um, the, the change at the same time. Um, what, what is the bigger picture that we have to have in mind in addressing these issues? Well, uh, I actually, I, looking at the five panelists, I'm, uh, I have a two hats. One is the public institution to support developing countries, so developing the agency, and also I'm a member of the World Economic Forum, Global Agenda Council on Poverty and Sustainable Development. So from that perspective, I'd like to argue First, the, uh, it is only two years since Myanmar government has taken and uh, undergoing the substantive policy reform. Therefore, there are a lot of things to be fixed and to be reformed. Therefore, in, in our uh, position, in our uh, institution, we already think that it's necessary to have some sort of uh, time elements or patience, that's one. Secondly, when we talk about education or, edu uh, or labor force, it's necessary to look at the same time the job opportunity, as rightly Aung San Suu Kyi mentioned. Therefore, this should be you know, not only focusing on education per se, but also uh, business opportunity, legal framework, or that kind of holistic approach. Not only that, cross-sector issues mm. like education. It is a very famous story that uh, 1,000 days after the pregnancy, the uh, 
nutrition is uh, playing a very crucial role to develop the brain. Mm -hmm. So to that extent, health and education are closely linked. And the job opportunity and the infrastructure improvement are closely linked. And of course, the, if macroeconomy get into the crash, this is a tragedy of the country. Therefore, the cross-sector, sequential order, and holistic, that kind of uh, way of thinking and approach is very necessary. So in this, uh, in this regard, we have been uh, taking this kind of very comprehensive, not single issue minded approach. Ah, the comprehensive holistic approach. Right, right. I see, I see. But you say um, it has only been two years yeah. since the reform and change has been happening. But uh, Dorsu has said that uh, you know, many things have, can be done in two years. And, uh, we're in the third year. <laughs> we are. <laughs> and, uh, by November, it'll have, we'll have completed three years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we're, what, June, July, August, September, October, November. So I think uh, what she means is that uh, you know, aspiration is okay, but uh, isn't it time for action? Uh, w would I be right in paraphrasing what you might want to say? <laughs> yes, I think uh, speed does matter. It does, it's not everything, but it's important. Three years is a long time in the life of somebody who's unemployed and having to depend on others for his daily living. And uh, you were talking about humanitarian help. Now, I would like humanitarian help to this country also to be linked to skills, to teach, give us the skills to look after our own humanitarian problems, not just helping us, but training us to cope for ourselves. Mm. I see. So, um, Mr. Arakawa, how would you respond to this uh, time frame of things that things need to be delivered now? Yeah, last week uh, I attended the TICAD, so-called Tokyo International Conference on African Development. The, exactly, the, the theme is nearly the same. Vision with action. The worst case, vision without action, or actions without vision. So, it's in our time. Then, uh, as far as the JICA is concerned, after this meeting, I'm supposed to sign the loan agreements for $500 million to, for mainly infrastructure projects. And this is uh, two, mainly three parts. One is quick fix type rehabilitation of power in the Yangon area. So in, 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 presumably the, the situation will be totally improved soon. And the other, other uh, second loan agreement is for regional development in a nationwide, mainly uh, ethnic group area uh, in order that they can enjoy the benefit of the uh, new reform policies. And third one is uh, special economic zone, uh, Tira area, which uh, the law itself is to provide the infrastructure for this uh, estate. But this will, anyway, the sh surely contribute to the promotion of the direct investment and will presumably the, give the opportunity for job. Mm -hmm. uh, could I just yeah. put in a word about skills here? You were talking about infrastructure yeah. development. And of course, we are very much in need of basic infrastructure, such as roads. But even there, I think we can bring skills in. We don't want our road workers always to remain at the level of road workers. So this is what I mean, that when you help us, either uh, in the form of development programs or humanitarian programs, I want our people involved to gain in skills so that they earn and they learn. Yeah. Earn and learn as you go along. That's what uh, I was going to say. Uh, the telecommunication infrastructure is going to be put in your country and decisions are going to be taken by the end of this month as we understood from your IT, ICT minister. Every single aspect of creation of the telecom infrastructure must go hand in hand with skills. If I were sending out the request for proposal, I would have included a component where skill building is one of the mandatory conditions of anything with the locals. We are trying to do in some of the construction projects in India as an example, where every single institution we build, there has to be a component of skill building, progressively increasing year after year, so that by the completion of the project, you're completely self-sufficient in the skills that you want to acquire. I think those are some things which you can enable. I see. Um, no, pro Professor Aniko, um, by the way, you must be happy with the gender balance on the stage, no? I love this. <laughs> I totally am delighted with the gender balance. <laughs> no, um, the, the panelists have talked about the um, you know, expectations for a sort of a you know, quick 
fix change as well as uh, long-term vision, mm. um, when a vision accompanied by action. Um, is there a risk that when you know, expectations exceed uh, reality, you know, companies or private sectors who are uh, disillusioned may you know, withdraw when they decide that uh, they cannot reap the benefit as quickly as, as they had hoped? You had spoken about the, um, the low-lying fruits theory mm. before. Could you elaborate that in Myanmar's context? First of all, I want to say a very warm good afternoon to all of you, and I want to say a big thank you to Myanmar. I think for the last two days, uh, for most of us, this is our first time in Myanmar, and it is for me. So can we congratulate Myanmar for being very <laughs> courageous and for hosting <laughs> this wonderful platform. Um, I want to do two things here. I want to stress the importance of public-private partnership. I think um, the industry are all very anxious, very uh, interested in coming into Myanmar. And of course, uh, the low-lying fruits that Aiko san was talking about is the, everyone is looking at the extractive industries, looking at the resources, looking at the uh, tourism and the healthcare areas. Uh, but I think, to be fair, many of the governments in emerging markets do not have deep pockets in order to invest in human capital development immediately. So there is a lot of room for companies to come in and they collaborate. And I do believe in what um, Dos Aung San Suu Kyi was talking about. Um, universities may produce engineers, but at the same time, they do not have engineers with niche areas. So you do need um, engineers that are in knowledgeable in the extractive industries or engineers in maritime and you need um, geologies uh, with a lot of deep knowledge. So between the institutions in defense of universities and the private sector, I think there's a great lot of room for development, for collaboration. So, you know, even in the low-lying fruits, uh, we shouldn't look at uh, Myanmar's labor. Wonderfully young population as just uh, labor content. We should look at them as the human capital resource and there's room for a lot of development. And I think the, not just vocational schools, even universities could be looking at hospitality and tourism management. And you could appeal to parents who want to send children to the um, colleges and to the universities that it's not just about vocational, that there's this aspiration towards development for the country. I'd like to add one more point. Uh, Singapore is a small country. And so what we do is we are like a little prototype. We do a lot of experiments. So universities do work very closely with industry and acquire skills. It need not go into your GPA. It need not go into your credit courses, but it could lead to a certification program working with a partner company. Uh, PCS does a lot of that in India. Uh, we have a trading concentration that I can talk about later where we work with companies in collaboration. So you may compete in the marketplace, but you collaborate with one vision to develop human capital in the core business within the local country that you're investing in. I see. Uh, Professor Ko, um, it gives me the impression that um, somewhat the sense of mission perhaps would be required on the part of uh, various actors that are coming to Myanmar, including the private sector, would, that, would I be right in saying so, a kind of a corporate social responsibility as, aspect of things? I think not just because it's a corporate social responsibility, there is a wonderful business um, reason for doing this. Mm -hmm. Human capital is a wonderfully sticky capital. <laughs> and if you develop the human capital in your organization well, you will be surprised you will attract like-minded people. Because many young people, when they graduate from universities today, they do ask questions like, what is the organization going to do to develop me? What are my career pathways with your organizations? So don't invest in human capital because it's the CSR project. Invest in human capital because it makes business sense. And you do create a group of young people who are loyal to the company because they could see that there is not just a job, it is also a career pathway for them. Perhaps, Duwasa Suchi, you might want to comment on that. 
Yes, I agree with that. I was just going to say before uh, Professor Ko said that, that corporate responsibility is good business. Yes. And let's face it, uh, businesses are operating for profit. Mm. And in fact, I would have no confidence whatsoever in a business that was failing to make profits. How can they help us if they can't even help themselves? So it's all very well, it's fine. I approve of businesses that try to maximize their profits, but at the same time, they must try to maximize our benefits as well. Mm -hmm. This is what PPP really means, public-private partnership for the growth and development of a country. And uh, since we're talking about growth and development, I have to say, and that this is uh, very much a theme of this forum, that I do mean inclusive de development. And this is essential in a country like ours, made up of very many ethnic nationalities, a diverse country. And if we are to make strength out of our diversity, there must be inclusiveness. And this is where businesses also come in. They, they, I would like them to look at the investments, not just from the view of benefits, but who is benefiting and how many people are benefiting, how inclusive are, are the benefits that are, they are bringing to this mm -hmm. country. Mm -hmm. Because if their investments profit one part of the country at the expense of the unity of the whole, then they're not doing us a favor not in the long run, in the short run, perhaps. So we have, to, we have to look at very many aspects of the situation. There are many challenges, but actually I think challenges, challenges are good for you. It keeps you on your toes, and that strengthens the muscles of your legs. <laughs> well, you sound very yes. practical. Yeah. Um, the, what you have just articulated for us, um, it, it, I think it is very much um, consi consistent with what you have said before. Um, the goal I as do well tend as the, to be consistent. <laughs> the, the goal as well as the means to achieve it must be just. So um, that is the requirement on the uh, part of the business community. That is the sort of role that you would expect of the business world. Would I be right in saying? Yes, and I don't think this is just idealism. Yep. I think it is just common sense yep. because the world is more and more concerned about justice. The times are past when you can be a robber baron and get away with it. And nowadays, I don't think Robert Barons will get away with it. They'll probably end up in the dock. <laughs> so uh, I think being just, to be just, just means building a better environment for yourself, that is to say your business, as well as the people with whom you're doing business. Mm -hmm. So in the end, I would like to look at business, what business is doing as creating an enabling environment for themselves, for their employees, for the country in which they're investing. Maybe um, our two panelists from the business community might want something to, to add. Yeah. I think um, the point about the corporate social responsibility has to be interwoven into the business itself, and it's not something which is standing in isolation to preach to the world, this is what I'm doing. So we are doing a couple of things in a country like India. One is trying to make it a certain percentage of the profits of the companies must be allocated for a corporate social responsibility. And the bill is going to be tabled in parliament and that should be through. Second is having allocated a certain percentage, the percentage varies anywhere from two to five percent of the total profits, which is a very substantial amount of money. Skilling as one of the initiatives which can be taken up by the corporates can certainly be using their funds from this corporate social responsibility, or more importantly, skilling for jobs. Mm -hmm. So what have we done within the Tata group? Even before the law becomes uh, pa passed by the parliament, we have already initiated a number of programs in terms of skilling where all the Tata companies have come together, creating, uh, creating a skills platform, and whether it's welding, whether it's masonry, whether it's electrician, whether it is IT, whatever it is, and region-specific skilling, which we are trying to do, so that the scale-up possibility becomes there. Individual initiatives may be small, but when you look at collectively, including other private sector players being a part of this, the government provides the land or the infrastructure which is necessary, use the existing infrastructure instead of recreating the infrastructures. I think the outcomes can be very, very quick. Time is of essence in all of these things because the youth are not going to be waiting for three years, five years before you say we are ready to start this program. Use existing facilities, existing infrastructure, 
But as the telecommunication rolls out, use the power of telecommunications to reach out to many, and finally the outcomes through a combination of on-the-job training and classroom training. Mm -hmm. And we take help from any country, whether it's a Swiss model, whether it's a German model, whether it's an Irish model, Australian model, Singapore model. We must be open to accept what is best for us, but make sure your people are involved so that they benefit in the process. Mm -hmm. Um, Dorsu, you have spoken about the inclusiveness uh, of the growth and that um, we're taking Myanmar to work uh, should, should be about uh, the people, about uh, lifting people out of poverty. Um, would I be right in saying uh, that uh, development or the dividend of uh, change has to be felt not only by the people living in like urban areas, but by almost 70% uh, of the population you know, who live in rural areas? Well, absolutely, because uh, inclusiveness means uh, that there's less inequality. I think one of the problems of the great strides that India has made in the last few years has been that inequality has not decreased. So that's growth. And there are some people who would argue that that's growth, but not development. Mm -hmm. that, or certainly it's not inclusive development. Development, of course, would be growth plus uh, a, a, a better, a better well-being for the people. And inclusiveness would mean that the proportion of people who have access to this greater well-being should increase all the time. And that is inclusiveness. Mm -hmm. And for our country, that is a necessity. It's not an indulgence. Because we are made up of so many different ethnic nationalities, all our peoples will have to feel that they are included in a bigger share mm. of the cake. If not, there will be political problems. And I'll have to repeat here, not just because I'm a politician, which I am, but because it's just plain common sense that we must keep political change and economic development very close together. We cannot divorce the two. Uh, they have to be linked for good. In, in, in that case, you know, for better or for worse, till de death do them part. And the point is that parting will be death for both. Yes. So we really have to keep together the necessary political changes and reforms with economic growth and development plans. Mm -hmm. I think uh, Professor Coyle wants yes. to comment. I, I really have to jump in here. I love the word development. And our, in Singapore, we, everyone has a Ministry of Manpower, but we actually have a Workforce Development Authority. And I think the earlier statement that uh, you know, Dalsu was talking about, lifelong learning is a very important component. Um, even after you have your diploma or your degree, you continue to have to learn. And I think the learning, a lot of it, is going to take place at the workplace. So, you know, for a long time, many corporations invest in the top layer. They send a lot of people for leadership training programs. But the forgotten middle layer is a very critical resource. And now my biggest passion is about the middle layer. Because you need to engage everyone in your company. And it has to be from the bottom, the middle, and up to the top. But the resources in many companies have been concentrated at the people at the top. So I think lifelong learning, making training available on the jobs, and how to develop the potential of an individual. I think having a job adds tremendous self-esteem. And if you want someone to come to your company with high engagement score, I think spend that investment on the development. So this is how I'm sure the organizations seated here are doing that as well. Right. Yes. So, um, Mr. Ayala, uh, since you are from the, the ASEAN country, one question I wanted to ask you of was, uh, what would be the impact of uh, like ASEAN community building uh, on Myanmar? Uh, we are talking about the empowering the people and empowering the country. But would it be a horizon expanding for Myanmar? Or is there uh, a risk of Myanmar's economy uh, yielding to the force of market integration if the economy is not viable enough? Well, I, I, I feel very, po let me just start by saying that I feel very positive about everything that's ha happening in, in, uh, in ASEAN. And, and of course, uh, Myanmar's uh, a strong engagement in recent years with, with the rest of ASEAN is actually very exciting for all of us and, and actually has put us back on the map. So for that, we are thank our uh, Myanmar neighbors for adding a, a new element of excitement, I guess, to the ASEAN story. Uh, but bottom line, I believe that there is a move towards 
an ASEAN that's becoming increasingly integrated, and uh, that means that generally there will be a, a movement uh, of people between our countries that's going to be more increasingly allowed. It'll be a freer entry, and I think it's in all our interest to take, uh, I guess, all our standards up. Uh, what I like about uh, ASEAN as a concept uh, is that generally all the boats, I believe, will rise with the tide. Uh, we will all look to each other to learn. We will all look to each other for investment. And we will all try to raise our standards to the level of each other. I think this is a very exciting time uh, for, for Myanmar, but its problems are not dissimilar to the ones that we face in other countries. Um, I think the fact that, um, that we're all working together uh, as an association of, of nations is an exciting one. And as we all move uh, to integrate, as we all move to share, as we all move to learn from each other, I like to think that we will all uh, you know, profit from, from taking our standards up to balance each other out. If I can just make one last comment on, on, on Madame Angsoshushi's emphasis on PPP, I'm a great believer in this concept. Um, I think for three points. Number one, the whole issue of resource allocation has not been put on the table. All our countries are challenged with the issue of resources. There are many demands. There's the agricultural sector, there's the military, there's education. There's so many things. I think engaging the private sector together with government um, in addressing these needs and bringing private sector capital to address many of the backlogs, I think is a wonderful concept. The right frameworks have to be put in place, uh, but bringing that capital to work for what were traditionally public sector interests, I think is a very exciting proposition to get resources allocated to the sector. Number two, there must be an alignment increasingly towards modernity and progress in the way students are taught. Mm -hmm. I think that alignment with the private sector would bring some focus on that. Uh, the issues of rote learning, of memorization, are irrelevant to a modern, uh, to a modern population. Uh, young people now increasingly have to think on their feet. Imagination is paramount. The conceptual component of, of, of their processing uh, of ideas has to, has to move up. The old traditional ways of learning have to fall back. An alignment um, with the private sector will help in that. And finally, and I think our friends from India mentioned this, uh, all of this has to be enabled by a very strong infrastructure network bringing technology uh, to the fore. Like, like uh, the sort of scheme Mr. Lakawa exactly. articulated. Exactly. Uh, that's earlier. exactly right. Mm -hmm. I see. You know, um, one of the, the key words that has been repeatedly uh, used uh, in our discussion would be, of course, uh, inclusiveness or the sustainability of growth. And um, Mr. Ayala has mentioned uh, you know, PPP, public private partnership to bring that about. Um, that, that is also Japan's agenda, Mr. Arakawa. Um, regarding human resource development, um, I think talents and jobs, uh, there needs to be a very good um, like matchmaking in a sense, otherwise uh, people won't be able to find and retain jobs. Um, matching the right talent with the right skills with the right job becomes necessary. Um, in that respect, uh, is there any specific uh, scheme of things that uh, JICA perhaps has in mind? Well, not only JICA, but also as a development partners like uh, World Bank, Asian Development Bank, DFID, and other bilateral agencies as well. They, we have already come up with the uh, so-called sector working group. Not single institution can get engaged in one single uh, sector or project, but uh, in a holistic manner and with concerted efforts, we have already established 15 sector working group so that in order to avoid the overlapping or in order to achieve you know, the goal more efficient way in terms of inclusiveness and so on. And also, as I said earlier, the, each sector has its own uh, relationship with other sectors as well. Therefore, interlinked sector solution should be done. So in this regard, this approach, sector working group, 15 sector working group, of course, together with the uh, Myanmar government or mm -hmm. under the uh, auspices or under the uh, initiative of Myanmar government, we have been working on that. So, uh, and also, we have been uh, accumulating the lessons learned from other emerging countries. Uh, what is success story, or what is a good practices, or what is a failure case. So there are lots of uh, lessons learned. And fortunately, the, there are many 
cases where we can le learn from the other countries' cases. And uh, Myanmar, fortunately, as a latecomer, so you can take advantage of all the failure or sex story into your uh, development agenda. Mm -hmm. That is uh, one of the things that mm -hmm. we can bring in. And, and that's one. Secondly, even though there are a lot of things to fix, but as you know, Professor Ko mentioned, these resources are limited. Mm -hmm. Under the resource constraints, how to achieve the goals in terms of sustainability or jobs or inclusiveness? That's a still challenge. Therefore, taking advantage of this platform of sector working group, we'd like to do our, our utmost efforts. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I understand there's going to be a what, Japan Center going to be launched? Oh, yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> well, this coming August, we are going to open up so-called Japan Center. One of the focus is vocational training, mm. taking advantage of Japanese technology or Japanese know-how or ethics, everything. You, you can... Uh, take advantage of this. Uh, Is it a one-stop sort of one thing? One-stop, yes. Very practical right. and very pragmatic. And lastly, the answers that you mentioned, inclusiveness and provision of basic infrastructure, that's very critical. Therefore, as I said earlier, the first project, regional development, major component of this project is to provide very small access, uh, access to the water, access to the electricity, and road improvements so that market access or access to the education. So this kind of a small step, but we like to continue this kind of a direction. Mm -hmm. um, could I just put in a word about Please. vocational training? Mm. That our legislature is in the process of drawing up a higher education law. And under that, we hope to put in, where well, we will be putting in vocational training programs. So I'm just remind you, you, you want to remind you that your programs will have to uh, be in keeping with our law. Okay. Mm. Sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, let, let me the primacy of the legislature. Okay. Well, let me put on my, my uh, reporter cap rather than the moderator cap because there, there was this question that I wanted to ask of uh, Doan Sasuchi about uh, Japan's the continued uh, assistance uh, in Myanmar. Uh, in Japan, uh, you, have, uh, you were cautious in evaluating the uh, significance of Japan's continued assistance to Myanmar, saying that there were both negative and positive aspects of things. Um, how would you make the evaluation now, and what are the roles that you would expect for aid organizations, including that of Japan, to play? Well, first of all, I want to make it quite clear that the Japanese people have always stood firmly by us, and I very much appreciate that. And I do make a distinction between the government of Japan and the people of Japan. Mm. Uh, with regard to the government of Japan, I cannot say that I've always agreed with their policies with regard to Burma. But uh, recently, we have been operating, working very closely with them, and uh, we have identified those areas where we think the Japanese government can help to promote skills, to create jobs, and to help towards growth and development. For example, I'm rather keen on promoting the silk industry in Burma. And of course, Japan is in a very good position to help us with that. And Ms. Dalaka is taking notes here. <laughs> yes. And also, <laughs> I'm going to talk about my constituency now. Some people object to my talking about my constituency because they say that I should talk about the whole of Burma, which is true. But after all, I do represent my constituency. And we've got a lot of bamboo in my constituency. And I would like to develop uh, skills connected to bamboo hmm. because I want to look at things uh, in the long run. Mm. We have an opportunity, which I think has been lost to many countries that developed before us, of preserving the beauty of our, our environment at the same time as we go for, envir uh, for development. Mm. And so, for example, I want to preserve the bamboo groves in my constituency, while at the same time providing skills and jobs for our people. So these are the kind of projects that I would like to concentrate on. And of course, these are rural projects. And as you mentioned uh, earlier, the great majority of our people live in the rural areas, almost 70%. And if our country is to become truly wealthy, the people of the rural area must develop. They must get richer. That then only can we claim that our country is richer. 
Of course, according to statistics, there are 26% of our people are below the poverty line. But I think, in fact, the figure is higher than that because that figure is based on data which, in the cases of some regions, are taken simply from the bigger towns. And, of course, that, they do not really re reflect yeah. the true situation of, of the country. Mm -hmm. Because, for example, if you are... Uh, I, I was uh, quite surprised to find that the poverty level in the Kayar state, for example, when some statistics came out about three years ago, was supposed to be um, in a better situation than... Or it, it almost rivaled that of Rangoon, and that doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. But this is because they only went to the main town in Kayar and looked at the electricity that was available here, there, the water availability, and so on. And, of course, they didn't go down to the villages at all. And in the villages where they had nothing, if you average it out, everything would have really... Okay. The, the figure would have come down okay. tremendously. So our poverty line, I think, certainly starts somewhere above uh, 26%. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot that we need to do for our rural population. I see. Very yeah, I think the point Dao uh, Hong Sang Suu Chi made with regard to I want something to be done in my constituency, mm. that's absolutely correct. If every single MP took up the responsibility of developing their constituencies from a skilling point of view mm. and creating the jobs either close to their homes or as the mobility takes place with the right kind of wages and the right kind of skills, solving the problem will become a lot more easier. Mm -hmm. That's what we are trying to do in India, where every single MP, some of them are really committed to this kind of an initiative, where they're coming and telling me, what can we do in our constituency, and I'll give you whatever you want, I'll give my time in addition to anything else. So the supply of youth for mobilizing for the skilling, advocacy for the skilling, not only to the students, but also to their parents, and then enabling the industry or entrepreneurship to happen, so that the whole value system, the value chain and the ecosystem is created. So I think my request is keep pushing this legislation mm -hmm. and every MP must own a responsibility for developing <laughs> the skills. And it makes them more accountable Absolutely. and responsible, yes. I It think. makes them more yeah. accountable and responsible and it's sustainable. Yes. No, there was um, a question that I wanted to address uh, our panelists from the audience. Um, I think it goes to Do Wan San Su Chi uh, about uh, cultivating talents or, or finding the right talents. Um, the person asked that the youth and adults under the military regime suffered unprecedented educational genocide. The most able citizens left the country for education and career. And there are millions of uh, Myanmar Burmese workers in neighboring countries and elsewhere. Um, do, do you think that it is important to bring those talents back to Myanmar? I want our country to be a place to which any of our people can come back to if they want to. I don't want to force them to come back. Mm -hmm. And of course, I would very much welcome it if they were to bring their talents back, if they would like to bring their talents back. But it's got to be voluntary. There's got to be willingness, a willingness to serve. And I do not mean full-time either. I'm quite practical, and I'd be quite happy if, for example, our, our doctors in the United States would like to devote one or two months a year to working with our young doctors in rural hospitals. There they will be providing services as well as teaching our young doctors skills, mm -hmm. training them. Mm -hmm. So I want our country to be a refuge, a true sanctuary for all our people everywhere. I, think, I believe the Chinese have a saying that... Uh, when, when leaves fall, they go back to the roots. They fall to the roots of the tree. And that is the kind of country I want Burma to be, where mm -hmm. our people can come back to wherever they may wish to, as one would go back to one's parents' home. Mm -hmm. I see. And I believe there's got to be um, the capacity to absorb that talent. This is why I say that they don't have to come back full-time, they don't have to come back permanently, but if they would like to make a contribution to what we're trying to achieve, uh, we should make it possible for them. I would, I'd like to go back to what I said earlier, an enabling environment. Mm -hmm. I think this is what we have to concentrate on. If I were to say, just put it in, put it very shortly, what we need most for growth and development and political progress, I would say an enabling environment. Mm -hmm. And that has a lot to do with the government, and that is to say the executive, the legislature, the judiciary. Mm -hmm. We all have to join in, in creating an enabling environment for our people. Oh, 
and also perhaps the international community can play a role of course. in there as well. But I do believe in um, standing on one's own two feet. Mm -hmm. I think right. people ultimately have to be prepared to work for themselves. Right. Right. Then, well, you know that old saying, God helps those who help themselves. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, the international co community probably is less altruistic than God. Mm -hmm. So we'll have to help ourselves a lot more if we want them to help us. Mm -hmm. And um, I think this question or uh, analysis um, goes to Mr. Ayala. Um, there was a poll taken um, on, among the participants. What should be the top priority for Myanmar to improve people's skills and encourage employment? And 22% uh, said promoting vocational training. 19% said creating world-class universities. 58% said compulsory secondary education. But I think uh, we've already, we already know the answer to this um, um, statistics, where we, we agreed that uh, it's really um, skills and human resource talents are required at all levels, really. Would I be right in saying that? Besides? Yes, I, I, I'd like to argue, I think maybe the division of the percentages is, is a reflection of the Myanmar of today. Um, I can't speak for the country, obviously, but... But obviously we need a balance of all three mm -hmm. and the country will go through its own stages of development and different skills will be needed at each stage. I think if I were in Myanmar shoes, uh, I, I, would, I would put a, a great premium on getting people employed and getting uh, the country's uh, e economy moving. That will need a whole different set of skills to, to a, 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 a more highly developed economy with more sophisticated needs. Um, I think a balance is needed. Uh, people have great capacities across a spectrum of educational needs. Everyone can contribute in their own way. Um, I think a balanced approach is as good as you can get. Well, um, the discussion has been truly engaging, and it is indeed perhaps an open-ended discussion. But I'd like to, to stop here for a while and give the audience uh, a chance to pose their questions to our panelists. Um, please uh, raise your hand, uh, identify yourself, make your comment uh, question as brief and as to the point as possible, and let us know uh, to whom you would like to address your question to. Um, I see many hands up. Um, I think I, I see a one hand over there. Um, a gentleman, could you please stand so, so that the microphone can come to you? Uh, Klaus Langefeld from GIZ, German International Cooperation Agency. Agency. We're already involved in this, in this country in uh, vocational training. We, have, we are planning to go there. I have a question to uh, Dr. Aung San Suu Kyi. Because uh, the German model works, we have so many, so f uh, little in, uh, un unemployment because we are the export uh, champion of the world. <laughs> we export more than one billion, uh, even more than China some years. My question is, if you need to give employment to those people, who have been trained, which are the sectors where, which you see most promising for Myanmar, for both the, the, the internal market and for the export market, including tourism, I'm, my main sector is tourism, uh, who can absorb those people who are trained? Thank you. Uh, I, I didn't say that the German model wasn't good. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just said I'm more familiar with the Swiss, and therefore I'm rather inclined towards it. Um, thank you very much for all you have done for vocational training in this country. I know that Germany and Switzerland are the two, only the two countries which have managed somehow or the other to retain their vocational training programs through mm -hmm. all the years of uh, military rule. And which sector? The sector that is most important really is the agriculture sector mm -hmm. because there are so many more people there. And then, of course, they, you can't really separate the two because when peasants are rendered landless and no long, they no longer have work in their own homes, they come to the cities and then they add to the unemployment pr uh, problem in the cities. Mm -hmm. So what I would like you to do is to concentrate on what you do best. I think that's how things work that whatever vocational training has worked best for you from the point of view of the trainers, I think that's what we want. But if you ask me where, which sectors I want you to concentrate on, uh, rural and ethnic, because I want development in this country to be even-handed. It must be inclusive, which means that whatever development projects and vocational training projects you are uh, instituting in the mainly Burmese areas of this country, I would like similar 
as many projects as possible in the ethnic areas as well. And that way, you will not only be helping our country to become more developed, but also helping us to become more unified. Mm -hmm. uh, and growth becomes more equitable. Yes, yeah. uh, inclusiveness. Mm -hmm. uh, gro growth, uh, unless it's equitable, and unless it's inclusive, in the long run, could lead to tremendous political problems. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, if only, the, if only the Burmese ethnic group are going to get richer and richer and richer, it's not going to help us to build a true union. Mm -hmm. are, are you beginning to see uh, perhaps a, a symptom of that already growing in Myanmar? No, I, do, I think the problem has always been there, and we have never had a, a, an opportunity or perhaps the circumstances have never been right for us to truly address that issue mm -hmm. and to resolve it. Perhaps we have time for two more questions and let me go in one go. Um, gentleman over there and the lady in uh, orange t-shirts there. Good afternoon everyone. Uh, thank you Aung San Suu Kyi for such an inspiring uh, conversation in this morning. I'm, I'm David Hertz, I'm from Brazil. I'm a YGL. And I'm a chef and a social entrepreneur, and I mentioned to you that food is a good way to skill everyone. I think um, food has the power, the potential, responsibility to transform lives. And I have examples from here, from Yangon. The Yangon Bakehouse, which employed unemployed women, and the Shwe Basse, that do the unemployment skills for youth. So my question, and I, I also want to just to mention that as a YGL, we came here before, and we did a food learning journey where we got the whole chain, the supply chain, the restaurants and the chefs with Miss Piu Piu Ting from Monsoon Restaurant. And she's going to become our leader here to put, unite everyone to support the farmers. And we created this food vision that we want to put into action. So my question is how we can put into action, because I'm from Brazil, I'm not going to be here, but I want to support this network to really use food to bring pride, proud to the country and also skills. Thank you. Oh. And shall, shall I go on to have another question oh. from the floor? Um, the lady in the front row, um, could you please stand so that the microphone can come to you? Well, it's a great privilege to be here. I'm from Pakistan. My name is Munize Jahangir. I'm a journalist. And uh, we have admired you from afar, Ms. Sutki, um, as one of the inspirational figures in, her, in your struggle for democracy, you have given us great inspiration. Um, I have two parts to my question. The first part is that uh, at the moment it seems that the military junta has some kind of investment in most of the major industries here in Myanmar. So when foreign investors do come in, what advice do you have for them so that they don't really um, uh, damage the political and the democratic struggle that your party and people like you have launched from Myanmar? The second part of my question is, it seems that you seem to be in a juggernaut here uh, in Myanmar. There is obviously a constitutional ban on you for not becoming president, and it also seems that the military has reserved seats in parliament. In that case, uh, how do you plan to get out of this? Do you have a framework for, uh, for Myanmar to go from military rule uh, and a transition of it to complete democracy? Well, first to answer the question about food, because that came first. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, since you are in YGL, may I say that my session with uh, YGL this morning was the most enjoyable I've had in this forum. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it really was. And I would, whenever I think of any particular issue, I like to look at different aspects of it. When you mention food, what immediately sprung to my mind was uh, the, the way in which we could help to make traditional food lucrative for our people. And what I've done practically is uh, I, uh, we have four um, constituencies in, this, in the Nepito area where uh, our, um, our MPs are in place. And I went to look at one of them a few months ago, and they, they served us a lot of the local, local sweetmeats. And they're very good. They're just traditional, just traditional Burmese snacks and sweets. And it occurred to me that I should, I would, it would be very good if we could promote these by asking the uh, hotels 
of which there are many in Nepido, to serve these to the guests rather than uh, Danish pastries and uh, French shoes. <laughs> and so, mind you, I'm very fond of Danish pastries. <laughs> and I'm very fond of the Danish people too. But uh, I thought this would be a good idea. And we started a little experiment asking this particular village to make sweets that they would deliver to a hotel and asking the hotel to try it out on their guests. So I would like you to work at this food venture in this way. You help villagers to earn money. You help us to preserve our traditions. Mm -hmm. You help to, uh, to develop the, uh, the culinary skills of our people. And you help our visitors to have nicer food. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's a it's win-win all around. Now, with regard to your two questions, first of all, uh, you said that you were worried that the military has an interest in many of the new uh, media enterprises and you would not like those who are investing to invest in the wrong ones. Uh, industry. Whether it is industry or whether it's a media, I think it's how you invest. Because for me, life should be an educational process. As, as I said earlier, it's, a, it's an unending process of learning. And those who happen to be investing in those businesses which are connected to the military must at the same time open the military up to the benefits of good democratic institutions. So it should be a learning teaching process. And you were also talking, and it's connected of course, the second question, uh, the provisions in the constitution which might stop me from standing for the presidency or which might stop this country from becoming a true civilian democracy. We have to take this step by step, and I've answered this question very often. I have confidence in the fact that the great, our people in the military, our military personnel, are also citizens of this country. The well-being of this country should matter to them, and I think it does matter to them. What we have got to make them understand is that what we are involved in is a joint effort. We are all trying to build up this country together to be the kind of nation we wish it to be. And I have always been very open about the fact that if our military were truly professional and loved and honored by the people, they would be so much happier than they are now. It's not power that brings happiness. It is the acceptance by your country of what you are and who you are. And I am confident that there are enough sensible people in our military to understand this. We'll take it step by step. I believe in nonviolence. I believe in reconciliation rather than confrontation, although I've been, con I've been accused of confrontation very often <laughs> simply because I want to confront problems. Con problems are there to be confronted so that they might be resolved. But basically, the way of resolving them is through building up mutual respect, as I said in our meeting this morning, mutual respect and mutual understanding, on which are the two ingredients on which we have to build our reconciliation program. But I have great faith in the Army. Well, thank you for the question. Thank you. Hey. Well, um, now um, we are nearing the end of our discussion, and I would like to ask one question of Doan San Suu Kyi. No, um, empowering the people of Myanmar has much to do with uh, what sort of nation uh, one is trying to build. Um, how would you uh, like to see Myanmar people empowered and develop uh, to bring about the country that they envision to bring about? The Myanmar, if we are going to talk about it in terms of practical skills, Education, of course, is, is uh, key. But I'm a little old-fashioned in this. Mm. I think that it's not just education in the sense of academic and technical skills. It's also mindset. It's a way people see things. And I do believe that basically human beings can discriminate between what is good and between what is bad. I do believe in that. If they had not had this capacity, we would be still running around in caves clubbing one another. And we're nowhere near that now. So we have progress, despite all setbacks, despite all the problems. I think that each and every human being, a normal one, a, a normally 
a normal, mentally healthy human being, has this capacity to tell the good from the bad. And I would like this capacity developed along with our technical and academic skills. Well, thank you, Doan San Suu Kyi. Well, this concludes this session. Um, to fully uh, realize Myanmar's potential, the dividends of change must be felt by all. And taking Myanmar to work, as we discussed, means uh, creating jobs and making people employable so that growth in Myanmar becomes inclusive, equitable and sustainable. Uh, our panelists have convinced us that the private sector must also uh, participate in the transformation that is taking place and that uh, only then can the optimistic projections for Myanmar become reality. Well, thank you everyone for your participation. Um, I'd like to have a big round of applause for our panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.